Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to Crossroads. I invite you to take out your teaching outlines as we're beginning a brand new series uh, for the new year. And just before we get started, let me ask, just get a, take a unscientific poll. How many of you have already blown it with your New Year's resolutions? Okay. So, dieting. How many of you got in a fight with your husband or wife, your kids, said something you shouldn't have? Okay. And it's only January 6th. Um, but thank God, I was thinking about that, because we don't make good on those lofty promises that we have as the calendar turns. But thank God for two things. One is, thank God for His mercy, His forgiveness. But also, I'm so thankful for God's strength, because as we look to Him, He will give us strength, not just to lose a few pounds or to shave off some meanness off our character, but so that we could grow and reflect Christ. And one of the chief reasons why we come to church is that we might grow closer to God and ultimately honor Him. Because whether we realize it or not, the way we live and conduct our lives sends out messages to others that don't have words. In other words, by the way we act, we're sending out vibes. Now, I'm not talking about in a mystical sense or energy, or in a transcendental sense, none of that nature. I'm just talking about simply our attitudes and our actions communicate what's going on right here in our heart and in our soul. And God's desire for you and I, especially as we turn a calendar year and we try to get a good running start to a new year. God's desire is, is that we would have healthy vibes that honor Him and that are helpful to others. And to encourage you and I along this path, the very first recorded sermon of Jesus that is found in Matthew chapter 5, which will be a launching point for this entire message series, contains Jesus instructing the crowds on how to be, believe it or not, happy. Sometimes people think, well, if I come to church, I can no longer be happy. i got, I got to turn in my smile to the usher as I come through the doors. There's no laughing. There's no smiling. There's no more joy. i got to look you know, somewhat like among somewhat you know, religious. i got to get this religious look on my face. First of all, there's no such thing. The heart of God is that you would be happy. Now, to be happy, to be blessed, how would we define that? Well, I think if we took a poll, people would go, you know what, if you could have more money, you'll be more happy. Well, just keep that thought for a second. Well, if I could have more prosperity, more promotion, more pleasure, that'll make me to be extremely happy. Well, here's the problem with those thoughts. If you don't have your health, what good are any of those things? Your health is vital to your life. And so God's desire, first and foremost, is that we would be a healthy people. We would be healthy mentally. We'd be healthy physically. We'd take care of the body God's given to us. Yes, we're aging. Another, even though, yes, Happy New Year, but hey, we're getting older. Another year older. But even though chronologically we're getting older, biologically, if we take care of our mind and our body and our spirit, we don't have to look and feel so old. Nevertheless, God's heart is that we would be healthy. That God's ideal of blessing and happiness is that we would be healthy inwardly and that that would permeate outwardly. And then the messages that we're sending to others and how we're conducting our lives, whether it be to God or other people, would be communicating a soul that is healthy. And so that should be our goal, and that was the heart of Christ with His opening teaching. And so I direct your attention to your outline and the verses in the Scriptures are there, they're on the screen as well. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, a launching point. Jesus is recorded by teaching, teaching the crowds, and it says this, When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and he sat down, and that was a, a proper posture for the teacher. You know, maybe we could reverse that. We'll get me like a sofa recliner up here, and we'll remove all the chairs, and you could stand, and I'll sit. I like that deal, okay? Uh, maybe we'll do that as the years go on. We'll revisit that next time, okay? It says that his disciples came to him, and this is not just necessarily talking about the 12 disciples because they all haven't been assembled yet as you harmonize all four gospel accounts. Uh, these were other people who are following Jesus at this point as well. 
Uh, but there's also a large crowd, we find out. It says he opened his mouth and he began to what? To teach. Circle that word teach because that's the heart of the ministry of Christ. And that's one of the main reasons why we come to church. You know, he didn't come to entertain everybody. I know that's big today in church. We want to be entertained. It's not show business, it's a service. He, he taught. You know, we heard about small groups. Joe got up and gave an announcement about small groups. Why? She wanted to teach people the Bible. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from where? The Word of God. It's the best way to grow. God's Spirit working through His Word. We're going to be offering a, a Gospel of Mark teaching that Johnny's going to help with. He, you're learning about the life of Christ. That's how we grow. And just like anything in life, we have to put the effort in. Well, Christ was teaching. He began to teach. And he began teaching them, saying, now notice what he began. And we're going to be looking at these different, what are the, they're called the Beatitudes, over the next couple of weeks together, and formulating our own healthy Beatitude. Verse 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, some of you might be saying, well, what do you mean? Is this, this is really good news? It is. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That's not talking about monetarily figures. It's talking about blessed are those who realize that apart from the grace of God, they have nothing. That is real health, by the way. Real health is not pretending to be this religious freak or nut that, has every, that knows everything and that has it all together. There is no such person. And no one ever impressed God or got to heaven because they were self-reliant on their righteousness or their religion. Blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, blessed are those who realize they're spiritually bankrupt apart from Christ. Chapter 11. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They will be saved if they understand that they need the grace of God. And then blessed are those who mourn. Now, certainly, we understand the fact that when we go through the loss of a loved one or a friend, whoever, God will comfort us. That is certainly in play all throughout the Scripture. This particular context here is talking about blessed are those who are repentant. Blessed are those that acknowledge that with their lifestyle, their sins, whatever, myself, I've offended a holy God. I can only speak for myself. I've offended God. And I'm going to be healthy when I stop running from God and I start running to God. I'm going to be the healthiest version of me when I get real with God. And I don't hide behind some religious mask. I don't behind, hide behind some self-help mentality that I get right and real with God. Blessed are those who mourn. Now notice this, for they shall be comforted. Comforted with what? Well, comforted with the forgiveness and the mercy of Almighty God. This is the healthy mindset that we need to have. This is the healthiness we need in our soul. This is not religion. This is a relationship with God. And that's what He wants you to have. So then, we can formulate together a week one principle that we're going to discuss today in terms of healthy vibes. Because we want to send out vibes that are healthy. Because guess what? If we think we're this super religious person, we're going to send out vibes of arrogance to other people. You might know people like that. Don't point, because we all need to hear the message, okay? My point to yourself. If, sometimes if we trust not in God and ourselves, we might become cowardice in our faith. We don't have a strong faith. Oh, I'm going to fail again. And so we're sending out vibes of defeat, okay? So we don't want to do that. We want to honor God and we want to help others. And so as we look at these two verses, we arrive at a week one principle. And why don't we say it together? Healthy are the brokenhearted, for they shall put out vibes of humility. That is a healthy posture of a soul. Like if we went to the doctor and he checked you and I out, you know, there are certain ways that doctors check people. Obviously, the old-fashioned thermometer, um, we know about, you know, you take, you take, get blood work done. If we're going to look at our health, we're going to look first at humility. If we lack humility, that shows that there is an unhealthiness going on within, and that's going to sabotage the rest of our new year, by the way. We want to have a healthy position with God, and that healthy position needs to be humility. Now, to illustrate this further, and this understanding of blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, healthy are the poor in spirit. You're going to be healthy spiritually when we're humble. 
I'm going to be healthy spiritually when I'm humble before God and others. And I'm going to send out a message. My life message is going to reflect Christ that much better when I'm humble. And I'm also going to be able to overcome temptation. I'm going to be stronger when I go through difficulties. All because I'm living this humble posture. It's vital to our overall health. And to illustrate this further, there is a classic passage in the Scripture that Jesus taught. It's a parable, actually, that Jesus is going to highlight what brokenheartedness looks like as well as humility. And so let's turn to Luke chapter 18, and we'll be reading verses 9 through 14. Now, in this particular passage, Jesus is going to use a contrasting method of teaching. He's going to highlight a tax collector and a Pharisee. The Pharisee represented the elite of religious society and ultimately one who was categorized by self-righteousness, sadly. Whereas the tax collector was the most despised person in Jewish society uh, because he collected taxes for Rome against the Jews. And as we know, as we find out from Matthew's account, Matthew was a tax collector. Matthew was a Jew who worked for Rome. He had the Roman guard that stood over his shoulder with a spear as he collected taxes, and he could tax anything. You thought we had a bed here in New York, okay? Matthew and any tax collector, they would tax, you, you, had, you, you took your cart, you didn't have an SUV, but you took a cart which maybe you were in, perhaps you were in the fruit business or you were traveling with your family, the tax collector at the port, he had the authority to have you empty your cart completely, and he could tax you on everything in your cart. Now, why did he do that? Because there were certain set things that the Romans wanted taxes for, but everything else, after he satisfied the price that he had to pay to the Romans, everything else he made on top of that was his. So you can imagine how these tax collectors gouged people on every little thing they could. So they were despised by the culture. And so Jesus is going to contrast these two people. So starting in verse 9, it says he also told this parable. Now put a slash there, because the previous parable, Jesus told a story about a woman. She was a persistent widow. She kept coming uh, for justice, for a need for her child. Okay, This parable falls along the same lines. We're not sure exactly the amount of time that passes in Luke's account, but it fits nicely in this understanding of faith and trusting God and humility. It says he also told this parable to some. Now notice this. This is never a good thing to be said of you and I. He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves. That's not a good thing, by the way. That they were righteous. And now notice the next part. When you are self-reliant and you're not trusting in God, and you are trusting in your own righteousness, a byproduct of that is this next part. Why don't we say it together? And look down on everyone else. You could take it to the bank. When you are a self-righteous, pharisaical, hypocritical person, it is just our nature then to look down upon everybody else. It's, it's inevitable. And so Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves, so that would encompass those who were outside the faith, those who thought they were in the faith, and those whose understanding of the faith is somewhat clouded at this juncture in their walk with God. Nevertheless, they had this unhealthy habit of trusting in themselves. And habits are tough to break, as we know. How many of you are trying to break habits right now? Okay, yeah. Some of us right now, they're tough to break. St. Augustine once said, habit, if not resisted, soon becomes necessity. And so that's why we must deal with a habit. Now, some habits are hard to kill off. We understand that. I constantly battle, and, and a lot of us constantly battle, with the temptations of food. We know that you know sugar is a, is a super highway for illness, but we try to battle it off. I mean, I was just tempted earlier. Um, my sweet little niece, Brielle, she just went to this candy show with my other beautiful niece, and uh, Gianna, and she had this bag of candy, and so I said, well, did you get me anything just jokingly? And she took out this candy sucker, and I said, I don't want that. What else you got? And Joseph says, you, and Joseph was there. He says, you got to do better than that. So she says, well, since you're my pastor and you are my uncle, I'll give you a Hershey bar. So she gave me a Hershey bar. 
So, so I got temptation sitting right here. So if anybody wants to help keep me accountable after the service, please. It's going to be right in my right pocket if I don't eat it before the end of the, the, the message. But we say that tongue-in-cheek, but whether it be food, whether it be some type of unhealthy poison that we're putting in our body in addition to unhealthy foods, uh, whether it be some type of immoral habit, something that nobody else knows about but you and God, our habits need to be dealt with because it represents a mistrust. We're not trusting in God. When we subscribe to certain things, it's really like, you know what, I got to do this so I could be comfortable. I got to give in to this because ultimately what we're saying is, is God can't meet this need in my life of satisfaction. So write this first principle down in your notes. If you want to have that healthy brokenheartedness so that you can have the vibe of humility before God and others, avoid, now write this down, address unhealthy habits. You got to address them address them in your life. And it all starts with a mistrust in God. And speaking for myself, any unhealthy habits that I have, I have to go back to the fact of, what am I not trusting God for right now in my life? And that was the whole point of Jesus saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. Because the context reveals, both in Matthew's account, and here now we're in Luke's account, is that this is a constant problem that the predominant belief system, which was that of a legalistic Jewish rabbinical teaching, that you had this self-righteous way to God, that you had to impress, you had to earn your way to heaven, this meritous way to heaven, this meritous way into God's favor, there was this complete mistrust in God. And it, it produced a lot of unhealthy habits within the community, and I'm sure within our own hearts the same could be said. But how do we do it? How do we form these healthy habits? Notice what Psalm 9.10 says. Why don't we say it together? A memory verse this week, together. And those who know your name put their trust in you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. There it is. If we want to have a trust in Almighty God in this new year, we want to be a people who are seeking God. You know, If you want to address your habits right now, if you're going to step out of denial and step into God's grace, it comes down to the question of, who are you seeking? Are you seeking first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness? Or are we seeking our own righteousness? Are we seeking our own pleasures? Are we seeking what feels good or what God has said is good? Now, what would define a bad habit? A bad habit is a sin in our life. And what do we do with sin? We address it. We address it by confessing it. That's the best way to do it. Now, you need to have Christ in your life in order to do that. God wants to give you strength. He wants to give you the power to overcome those bad habits. In fact, every bridge that you have crossed in your life, every success story of a bad habit that you have left in the past was the empowerment of Almighty God. And we want to be thankful to him for that. We want to realize that sometimes there are habits in our life that we have formed just over time that are hard to get rid of, and we got to do something about it. I heard the story about a passenger who tapped a cab driver on the shoulder to tell him something. The driver screamed, he swerved off the road, and he came within inches of a department store window in the city. He turned around and yelled at the passenger and said, this is all your fault. How could you do this to me? The passenger said, all I did was tap you on the shoulder. Why are you blaming me? And he said, I'm terribly sorry. This is my first day driving a cab. What did you do before that? Well, I drove a hearse for 25 years. (laughs) I think you get the point. Sometimes... Some of you are just waking up. <laughs> Some of us, we form habits just because, of our, just because of our job. Sometimes we form habits just because of where we live. Sometimes we form habits, and I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not advocating blame shifting. We just have to be sensitive to the fact that we have to deal with the realities in our life, and we do that by getting right and real with God, and we address any bad habits, and we also address what might be some potential causes of them and treat them. It doesn't mean we're blaming. It doesn't mean we're scapegoating. 
It means that we are acknowledging and addressing. And we have to roll up our sleeves and get to work because blessed are the brokenhearted. Healthy are the brokenhearted. Healthy are those who are the poor in spirit. Jesus says healthy are those who mourn over whatever bad habit they have. You know, we live in a world today that wants to condone everything we do. We live in a world that actually encourages us to pursue sin. We live in a world that is raising young children to have absolutely no respect for their children, let alone God. And so it's vital to our Christian walk and our home and our sanity for crying out loud that we stop having this mentality of, I'm going to do whatever I want. Well, in many ways, we have free will. We can, quote unquote, do that, but that is not going to help us pursue the healthiest version of you that you want. And so we want to address unhealthy habits. Write this second principle down. Avoid comparing myself to others. Let's say that together. Avoid comparing myself to others. Now, you don't got to raise your hand for this, but maybe you compared yourself to somebody when you walked in today. Oh, look at her hair. Look at his shoes. Look at their car. Look where they're sitting. Look at this. And you might do, we, we do that sometimes. And we tend to look at other people and what they have, and I want this. But remember something. You know, that old saying, you know, the grass is not greener on the other side, or the grass is greener on the other side. No, the grass is greener where you water it and you fertilize it. That's where the grass is green. And we have to look at our spirit like that and our walk with God like that. Now, here comes the comparison. Let's dive into it. It says, two men went up to the temple to pray. Now, that's a proper thing to do because the temple is known as a house of prayer. Isaiah 56, 7, Matthew 21, 13, if you wanted to jot that down, tells us that. It's a house of prayer. So, so far, so good. But here's where we get into trouble. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, as we mentioned earlier at the top of the message, the religious elite had a habit of looking, bad habit of looking down upon people. The tax collector wasn't the most honest person. He wasn't the most favorable person in society. Probably wasn't getting invited to too many New Year's you know, Day brunches. Nevertheless, verse 11 says, now we hear about the Pharisee. The Pharisee was standing. Now circle that, standing. Now that's an acceptable posture for prayer. The only problem is, is he was standing to be noticed, which is not acceptable before God. It says the Pharisee was standing, and notice this, praying like this about himself. What? That's not what prayer is to be. Hey, let me call you up. I want to tell you how great I am. What? Hey, what are you doing later? You have some time? I just want to tell you how marvelous of a person I am. You're not going to have too many friends if you act like that. I just want to help you out. Now, this sounds so hypocritical. The Greek language conveys that he's praying to himself. So he's, he's giving the posture of prayer. He's giving the appearance of prayer, but he's not connecting with God. He's actually thinking he's going to impress God. So he's praying to himself about himself, and this is what he says. God, I thank you, now listen to this, that I'm not like the other people. Greedy, unrighteous, adulterous. And then, out of his peripheral vision, I imagine him seeing the tax collector, and, he, and, and now he has an example in case God didn't understand, by the way. You know, you know, God who created the universe. God who hung the stars in their expanse. God who formed the human body. God who puts the earth in its rotation. You know, maybe God didn't understand. So he says, you know, hey God, in case you're a little stu not God, let me tell you, like this tax collector over here, like this loser over here, I'm not like him. I thank you that I'm not like him. My friends, this represents a total, listen now, listen, understand this, a total departure from the gospel of Jesus Christ. This man is making a showcase of himself. And again, we have come to a generation now in church where people are more focused on being entertained than being edified. It's a shame. Uh, we, need, we need the wind of the smoke machine instead of the wind of the Holy Spirit in our life. What a, talk about being at a crossroads in our culture now of needing to know what matters most. Christ matters most. None of that stuff does. It, this represents a comparison mentality that I, I need to find this and I need to have that. Now, He's doing it in a self-righteous way. 
Now, sometimes we do it in a self-deprecating way. In other words, sometimes we put ourselves down to actually feel better about ourselves, and we compare ourselves to other people. Well, I'm not as good as this person. I'm not as good as that person. Who asked you to be? you got to be you. you got to be the person that God saved you to be. you got to run the race that God's called you to run. And you don't want to compare yourself to anybody because that's not what God has called you to do. You certainly don't want to do that on the self-righteous mentality because that's not a broken-hearted person. And you certainly don't want to do that in a poor me syndrome because that represents a person who's not trusting in God. It's trusting in their version of Christianity. You want to be a person that is given over to God in such a way that you are looking for his endorsement, not necessarily the endorsement of other people. And that is what we see playing out here before our eyes. Now, it's vital to our walk with God that we don't get in the comparison business. Because if we're not careful, we're going to be given over to something that we want so bad. You know, I want to be like this, and I want to be like that, and I want to have that. Reminds me of a story I heard about a man who saw an eagle circling a weasel. And the eagle got lower and lower until the eagle plucked the weasel out of the ground. It was like something out of a movie, the man said. But then he noticed something even more remarkable. As the eagle began to get up and fly, the weasel started biting at the eagle's chest, started tearing him to pieces until the eagle started to get lower and lower, and then finally started ripping the eagle's heart out of his, out of his chest until the eagle fell to the ground and died, and the weasel trotted off away. Beware of what you're trying to go after. It's vital to our life. Avoid going after the comparison. And I understand there's a lot of teaching out there. Again, the prosperity gospel is raising people to have that mentality. I got to have this. And if I don't have that, then God doesn't love me. And this is going on in my life. I mean, how many times have we felt like when we have a trouble in our life or a difficulty, where's God? You know, look at this person's life. They don't have any of those problems. You know, how come I don't live like that? And we start to go down that road. That's not of God, that's of the enemy. Avoid such thinking. As you flip over your notes, write this third principle down. I like to just pause right here, not, not the message, but pause right here to highlight something. Let this be the focus of this new year with God. You will draw very close to God, and I will draw very close to God with this fo focus. Write this principle down. Adjust my focus onto God's mercy. It's all about the mercy of Almighty God. Why don't we say that together? Adjust my focus onto God's mercy. You want to have a focus that is on the mercies of Almighty God. Now, continuing with the tax collector, if it wasn't enough to point, uh, the Pharisee rather, if it wasn't enough for him to point out the tax collector as well as name other people's sins, and some people do that, you know, they name everybody else's sins. What about, what about my own sins? The tax collector now is going to come into view, but before that, listen to what the Pharisee says. He tells God about all his accomplishments. I fast twice a week, which is a good thing, by the way. I give a tenth of everything I get. Nothing wrong with that. He's listing all of his accomplishments. I do this, I do that. And you can almost hear the angels in heaven going... Wow, you're great. And sometimes people act like that. You know, we serve the Lord and we want to get a thank you all the time. It's not about that. It doesn't represent a heart of humility. It doesn't represent a focus on mercy. Equally, the same is when we have complaining and bellyaching to God and to others. You know, if people are washed in the mercy of Christ and the grace of Almighty God, they're just happy to be at church. Thank God we get to go to church. Thank God we have all these different ministries. Thank God we have heat. A couple years ago, we didn't have heat in here. The heater was broken. You know, it, why does it have to take for you and I for the roof to fall in for us to become a, reacquainted with God's mercy? That's how we are as people. We have to adjust our focus onto God's mercy. Why? Because listen to what God approves of. But, now circle the word but, if there was ever... A contrasting word in this parable, here it is. But the tax collector, here he comes. Notice where he's standing, far off. The, 
the Pharisee, he's up to as close as you can get to the Holy of Holies so he could be seen. But the tax collector, he's standing far off. He would not even raise his eyes to heaven. I mean, this, this man has a humble posture here. But, what is that? What does it, what it say? What? But he kept striking his chest and saying, God, say it with me, have mercy on me. And you don't want to say this next part, but say it anyway. What? A sinner. We're sinners. I'm not a sinner. I'm not. Yes, you are. You better believe you are. And so am I. Oh, but I did this sacrament, and I did that, and I did this, and I served this, and I gave that. Good for you. We'll give you a plaque after service. By the way, I'm just kidding. Don't ask anybody for a plaque. We're a sinner saved by grace. Covered in His mercy. It all starts from there. I don't need to hear this. I'm above this. No, you're not. The fact that you even think like that shows that you're out of focus. It's always about the mercy of God. Always about that. If you think you arrive past that, or that is too elementary for you, then you need to get left back and come back to the understanding of what it's all about. we got to adjust our focus upon mercy. I heard the story about a mother who went to Neapolitan and, and said, have mercy on my son. And he said, ma'am, I can't. He has twice caused an offense, and justice is what is required. And she says, well, I don't, I, I'm not asking for justice. I'm asking for mercy. And then Neapolitan replied, he don't deserve mercy. And the mother said, that's just the point. It wouldn't be mercy if he deserved it. And then Neapolitan exercised power and extended mercy. God wants to give you and I mercy. Back to the text here. It says, but he kept striking his chest. Why was he doing that? Was he doing King Kong or something? No. That was a sign of repentance because what's in the chest? The heart. And the heart, the soul, is seen as the seat of our human emotions, our conscience, and our will with God. The heart and the mind working together. He was coming in essence of repentance to God. Now, some of you who are here for the first time are thinking, oh, repentance, confession, I know about that. i got to get online after service. No, you don't. Some of us might be thinking, oh, I don't need to repent of anything. Yes, we do. You want to come clean with God. He was beating his chest. This is where the heart connection is. He was brokenhearted. And he said, God, have mercy on me. I submit to you that one of the best prayers you could pray every day is, God, have mercy on me. Let's run through these verses here. Psalm 34, 18, a great verse to get to memory. Let's say it together. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Psalm 51, 1. Have mercy on me, O God, because of Your unfailing love, because of Your great compassion. Blot out the stains of my sin. And they cause problems and stains. And then Psalm 51, 17. Listen to this. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. See, the lies from the pits of hell don't want you adjusting the focus on the mercy. It wants you to adjust the focus on to merit. Merit your way to God's forgiveness. Merit your way to peace. Merit your way to hope. Merit your way to prosperity. Merit your way to promotion, to purpose, and all these other things that are out there. What we must realize is, is none of that works. That's a bridge to nowhere. But the bridge that leads to the overflowing fountain of grace is the bridge of mercy. The mercy of Almighty God. And in this new year, you want to have your focus on the mercy of God so that you could be the healthiest person that God has created you to be, that He's willed for you to be. You can't get nicer if you're, you keep getting meaner, by the way. We want to be people of mercy. Well, in order to be people of mercy, we need to understand the mercy of Almighty God. Let's light this last principle down before we close. Since God responded with that in such a dramatic way to this man we're going to see in just a moment, write this principle down. Anticipate God's favor upon humility. Can we say that together? 
Anticipate God's favor upon humility. God wants to favor those who are humble. God wants to favor those who are teachable. Now, it starts off by saying in verse 14, I tell you. Circle the phrase, I tell. That word, I tell, speaks of the authority of Jesus. Now, this correlates with the last part there when the man said, have mercy on me. God, have mercy on me. That word mercy in the Greek language, hilateimai, means to make satisfaction. In other words, God, may my sin record be satisfied. It's as if you went to go pay a bill and you had owed a balance, and after you paid it, they put paid in full. In other words, you satisfied the balance of whatever you owed. The balance has been satisfied. When the tax collector prayed, he prayed, God, satisfy my balance with your mercy. Because that's the only way the balance of our stupidity and our sin could be satisfied is with the mercy of God. Jesus responds and says, I tell you on my authority, not rabbinical authority, not the Pharisees or anybody like that, I tell you, this one went down to his house. Now circle this, justified. That word didacheimos in the Greek language means permanent. In other words, because of the mercy of God, as God looks at you and I, we are permanently justified because of the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross. All of our past has been paid for in full. Which then brings up the argument, if that is true, why in the world, whether it be a new year or you trying to be a new you, why would we want to go back to our past if He has permanently justified us from our past? We want to anticipate God's favor upon those who are crying out for His mercy, who are humble. And it says this, He went justified rather than the other. Well, I, get, I bet you could guess who the other is. The Pharisee. Because everyone, notice this, who exalts himself will be what? Humble. Benjamin Franklin, one of the early state, American statesmen, had a list of virtues that he was trying to accomplish. And every time he would r- rise to the occasion to accomplish it, he'd, he'd cross it off. But he said in his memoirs, every time he got to humility, he went backwards. Every time he thought he arrived at humility, he realized he wasn't very humble. Notice what Jesus says here. Everyone who exalts himself will be humble. Listen, one way or the other, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. One way or the other. You cannot dumb your nose to God. One way it's going to catch up to us. So everyone who tries to exalt himself will be humbled. But listen to God's favor here. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Will be blessed, in other words. Will have that health, that happiness that God wants. That God is looking to bless you and I as we do it His way. And so anticipate in faith that God will provide for your needs according to His riches in heaven when you and I are living a broken-hearted life. Now, I'm not saying we got to walk around with our head down to the floor, oh, God, woe is me. No. Rather, if you've been saved and you've come to Christ, you now live your life in respect to what God has done, and you're sending out vibes of humility. That's why people who brag about themselves, who self advertise themselves and promote themselves about how great they are, it represents somebody whose focus is off of the mercy of God, and certainly they're not sending out vibes of humility. If you don't know Christ today and you've been invited here to to hear the message or to come, it's the new year, so let me go to church, I applaud all of us for being here. Hey, guess what? You have perfect church attendance this year. Okay, that's great. You have perfect church attendance so far in 2019. But greater than that, God wants you to know that because of His Son's mercy and grace, you too can be justified. You too can be people of mercy. Now, the beautiful thing about living your life this this way is that you become a person of service to others. In fact, 
uh, we're going to be partnering with a few other churches to participate in a beautiful ministry called Night to Shine on February the 8th. And if you're interested in that after service, we invite you to come up to the front. We'll have some volunteer forms for you. And what that is, is that's a prom for, uh, for young people who have special needs. It's a great ministry through the Tim Tebow Foundation. Now, while the rest of the world wants to live their life in the fast lane, what could I get? God has saved us by his grace and mercy so that we could give. Healthy are the brokenhearted, for they shall send out vibes of humility. And guess what happens? When God's people are living this way, we could do great things for the kingdom of God and for the people of this world. That is the focus that God wants us to have. And so Isaiah 66.2 says it this way. This is God's heart. Listen to this. These are the ones I look on with favor. I would say we should pay attention to this. Why don't we say it together? Those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. God is looking to bless you and I as we live a humble life. Healthy are the brokenhearted, for they shall send out vibes that honor God, humble vibes that honor God, and that are helpful to others. My friends, in 2019, God wants you to know something that's been true for every year of this his, the history of this world. And that is this, is that God's will and His heart is for you and I to be healthy. To be healthy in our soul. So that we can live the healthy life that He has for us. And my prayer is that you and I, whether it be physically, that we would adapt healthy nutrition, healthy exercise, healthy postures in terms of our mind, uh, healthy relationships, healthy emotions, all of these things God is the author of, by the way. We keep going to the world's marketplace for the very things that God is the author of. It all comes back to this, this heart of God that we want to be right with God, be real with God, so that He could do a righteous work in our lives. And in 2019, let it be said of you and I, that we are brokenhearted before God, that we are saved by His grace and His mercy through faith. And now we are living a humble life to honor Him and to be helpful to His kingdom plan. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Well, in just a moment, we're going to participate in communion as is our practice once a month at the beginning of the year. And communion is a beautiful opportunity that is represented in the Scriptures as something that Jesus has left as an example. Whether you have partaken in communion a thousand times or this is your first time, guess what? It's all about Christ. If you have accepted Christ in your life, you're welcome to participate in communion today. Communion has no power to save you, but it is a reminder of the one who has Jesus Christ. And so with that said, I'm going to ask that you bow for a word of prayer. And if you've never asked Christ into your heart, I invite you to do so right now. You can't be saved by somebody else's religion, by somebody else's Christianity. You're going to have your faith in Jesus Christ alone. If you've never asked Christ into your heart, now I'm talking about religion. I want to invite you, you've heard the gospel today about God's mercy, how God forgave this tax collector, how God has forgiven me, a sinner, you, a sinner. Accept him into your life. And pray this prayer that is formulated from verses in the Scripture. Just say this in the quietness of your own heart. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. I believe in your Son, Jesus Christ. That He died for my sins and rose from the dead. Forgive me, O oh God. I ask Christ into my life to be my Savior and my Lord. I believe He is your Son and that He died for my sins and rose from the dead. Grant me forgiveness and eternal life. With all of our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you pray that prayer, we'd love to know about it after service. Celebrate it today by receiving communion. But our Father and our God, we ask for your mercy. Forgive us, O oh God, of our 
pridefulness, of our ungratefulness, O oh God. Remind us once again of the cross, of your forgiveness. Forgive us, O oh God, of how we've mistreated others, of the judgment in our own minds and hearts. Forgive us, O oh God, of the things that we've done, O oh God, whether it be this past year or even this past hour. Have mercy upon us, O oh God. Thank you for the privilege to come to church and to partake of communion today. Thank you for this reminder that you've left for us. We dedicate this new year to you, and we ask for your blessing upon us and our family that we would be a humble people, O oh God, laser-focused on your mercy. We thank you, O oh God, and we praise you, and we commit these words. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.